Good morning, good morning church. As you make your way in this morning and grab your seats, we are glad to have you worshiping with us this beautiful morning. My name is Jonathan Goolsby. I am our director of the youth. On behalf of the rest of the staff, welcome. If you are new with us or visiting with us, we have a connection table right outside these doors with a little more info about our church. Uh, please feel free to fill out an information card or ask anyone in a green serve shirt, serve shirt myself, Austin, Pastor Don, we would love to meet you uh, this morning. A couple of announcements as we get started. Um, we have a busy week ahead of us here at Evergreen. There is a Thrive Pool Party uh, this Wednesday, and so that is 11 a.m. to 2, and so that will be our first Thrive event with Nikki uh, Chadwick at the helm as the children's director, and so we are hoping that all of our um, young families and elementary age kids can join us for that. That will be at the Gray's house. You can RSVP through the church office with Nikki or via the newsletter. And so that is this coming Wednesday. Hoodies for I-58 now through July 17th. We are continuing to collect hoodies for the local kids in need at I-58 for their back-to-school hoodies. Um, we'll have, we have a few more cards left out in the lobby with info on what each child is interested in, their sizes, what they would like. And so if you haven't picked up a hoodie pack or a hoodie card, uh, to purchase a hoodie for a child, then you can stop by the table and do that. Don't forget to turn in your ticket with the hoodie that you purchased. Um, so you can drop those off in, in the lobby or during the week. Uh, thank you so much for supporting uh, those students and I-58. Tonight is youth kickball night, kids versus parents. And so the youth are going to meet out at the log house at 6 p.m. We're going to eat sub sandwiches. We're going to do a recap of what we've been discussing over the last few weeks with our summer series. And then we're going to head across the street over to Oak Grove's uh, Park to play kickball kids versus parents. And so I need all of our parents to show out and show the kids actually how to play kickball. You'd be surprised at how often I have to you know, wrangle in errors at kickball, have no idea what a pop fly is. Like, what do you mean you can't run? I can't run? No, I can't run. So anyways, parents, kids, come support, come out and play today, 6 o'clock at the Log House. If you have any questions about where the Log House is, you can come ask me or send me a text. We have a covenant partner meeting uh, between services today. And so, um, or I'm after second service today. As a reminder, we'll have a gathering for anyone interested in becoming covenant partners. Um, and so that will be immediately after the service today, and so you, if you have an RSVP, don't worry, you can jump in and join us uh, anyway for lunch and the opportunity to learn a little bit more about Evergreen Church if you've been visiting with us and have any questions about what we do and how we operate and just those types of things. And so please join us today after second ser service. Between services that today, we have a congregational meeting, and so you can join us directly after this service for a quick meeting that will take place here in the main sanctuary for electing Austin uh, to the associate pastor position. Oh, go a little, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we are ready for that and excited for that, and that is between services today. I think that is all the announcements I have for us this morning. Again, glad that you are joining us in worship as we continue this morning.
Good morning. It's great to be here this morning with all of you. Our worship today will start with a call to worship from Psalm 100. It's a great chance for us to claim the joy and gladness of knowing the goodness of God. So if you're able, please stand with me. I will begin by saying, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen. Before we sing our opening hymn uh, this morning, just a quick word. You probably noticed that Becky is not over here uh, this morning. Uh, many of you, all, I think, already are aware that uh, Becky and her husband Joe have built a house in Kentucky next to their daughter, uh, and they'll be moving. And But her schedule changed a little bit. She was supposed to be here with us through the end of June, but their moving schedule and selling their house schedule kind of changed. So last week was actually Becky's last uh, Sunday here as our uh, pianist. Uh, but she may slip in, her and Joe, a time or two before the end of July to worship with us. But we're very privileged this morning to have Dr. Kelly Jackson with us playing for us this morning in our worship service. So Kelly, it's wonderful to have you. And already you've seen and heard uh, the wonderful talents that God has blessed her with. Kelly and I go way back 20, we were thinking this morning, 20 some odd years uh, that we've been working together, first in Clayton County and then in Fayette County. Uh, but Kelly is a retired music specialist, elementary music specialist from Crabapple Lane uh, Elementary. Some of you are nodding your heads, so maybe some of you had her as a teacher, maybe. Uh, the younger ones, the younger ones, <laughs> younger ones. Uh, but we're thrilled to have her uh, accompany us this morning uh, and helping us lead in worship. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. The ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid. I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood when all around my souls give sway. He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, His righteousness alone, for less to stand before the throne. Oh. 
on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Thank you. Please. As we prepare to come before the Lord and confess our sin, let us listen to what the Lord says through the prophet Isaiah. God says, I dwell in the high and holy place and with the contrite and lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. These are the ones I look on with favor, says the Lord, those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. Let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. Let us lift our hearts to God in heaven. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. When we call, answer us. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Come and listen to us. For out of the depths we have cried to you. Having gone before the Lord and confessed the ways we have continued to sin, let us also claim the way God continues to save us and forgive us. I'll begin by saying, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Our hope is in the Lord, for with him is steadfast love and abundant redemption. The Lord redeems his people from all their sins. Amen. to a neighbor or go across the aisle, say hi to them, and we'd like to invite our children up for a time with younger Christians.
Alrighty, good morning. How are you guys? It's been pretty hot out, hasn't it? I feel like I could use a little water. So I'm gonna pour I'm gonna pour some water for us. Well, this morning I have a few verses that I wanted to read from you for you from the book in the Bible of First John. And so the first verse is we love because God first loved us. That's a pretty straightforward verse, so let's all repeat that after me. We love because God first loved us. Well, we know from first John, and I want to use a little example here for us. Uh, we know, so let's say that these three cups, these represent us, right? So here we go, just plain water here. But this cup, this cup represents God. And we know from 1 John 4.16, it says, God is love. So, this is God, and God is love. We're going to use the red dye to represent the fact that God is love. And we know from the verse we just read that we love because God first loved us. And so what happens is God, through Jesus Christ, who came to love us, and to pay for our sins, came. And now, we love because God first loved us. But, if I have just received the love of God, do you think I should just keep that love that I have received from God to myself? No. Right? So, it says in 1 John 4.11, it says, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So what does that look like? What does it look like to love one another? Do you guys have any ideas? No ideas at all? <laughs> we'll work on it. But here's what happens. So this represents us who have first received the love of God, right? When we love other people, what happens is they too receive the love of God that we have received. So when we love others, when we're kind to them, when we pray for them, when we're nice even though they might not be nice to us, we have a way of sharing that love of God that we have first received to our neighbors. And so, let's think about how God, who is love, loves us first and allows us to love others with that love of God. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for loving us. Thanks for sending Jesus to not just die for our sins, but to show us what your love looks like. And so, we pray that you help us love one another as you have first loved us. It is in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Austin. And I know I, I carried my Bible up here, but don't worry. I'm not preaching this morning. <laughs> it, it reminded me of one of our dear souls who has gone on to the church triumphant one Sunday I did preach. I think it was probably before you came, Don. And, and she was in the choir. And uh, the next Wednesday at choir practice, she pulled me aside. She said, John, do you realize you preached 38 minutes Sunday morning? <laughs> so don't worry. Not going to preach. But we are going to have a teaching moment here. And going along with what Austin had just taught, not only taught the children, but taught us about the love of God. Before I teach you, and I appreciate you helping me out since, you know, the choir's on break. I've been out of school for teaching, uh, from teaching about a month, so uh, you're going to help me. I'm kind of going through withdrawal of not being able to teach, so uh, you're going to help me this morning by allowing me to teach you a new hymn. And that new hymn speaks very much of the love of God that Austin just talked about. And also, it reminded me of a verse in the book of Romans. You'll be familiar with this verse. In the 8th chapter, verses 37 
through 39. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from what? The love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And when I read the words to this new hymn, it reminded me of how wonderful the love of our Father is and nothing can separate us from that love. So we're going to learn a new hymn. We're going to be singing this hymn in a couple of weeks. Uh, So we're going to teach it to you. So uh, I need you to sing out real big, impress Dr. Jackson with your congregational singing as we teach this. I think we're going to have the words up here, the name of the hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. So the way we're going to do this is that I'm going to um, sing a phrase, and uh, Dr. Jackson is going to play uh, the melody, and I'm going to teach you a phrase at a time, and we're going to kind of put it all together so that when we sing this in a couple of weeks, you can sing robustly. So here is the first phrase. If I can, the print's kind of small. Okay, it goes like this. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. Okay, now you get to sing that with me. Okay, ready? Dr. Jackson's going to play along with us. Ready? And... How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure. That was really good. Now, the second phrase we're going to sing is exactly like the first phrase except for the last two notes. It goes like this, and go ahead and play along with me, Dr. Jackson, okay, that he should give. It goes like this. That he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. So sing that with me. Ready? That he and. That he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. Good, okay. Mara, if we could go back, and we're going to put those two phrases together, okay? So, from the beginning, here we go. Ready? How deep. Ready, and. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. Now it gets a little bit different, okay? The next phrase, how great the pain of searing loss, goes like this. The end. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away. Okay, take a deep breath and sing that with me. Ready, and how great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away. Then the last phrase is like that second phrase. It goes like this. As wounds which near the chosen one bring many unto glory. So that last phrase, as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many unto glory. Sing that with me. Ready? And. As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many unto glory. Okay, you ready for the whole thing? Okay, you ready, Mario? From the top again. Okay, how deep? Okay, ready? And just the melody goes. Okay, ready? And how deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. That he could give his only son 
to make a wretch's treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many unto glory. Now there are three verses, but we're just going to use the first verse to, to teach this morning. But now let's do it with the accompaniment, with all the other notes and everything along and see how we do. Let's stand, okay, if that's okay. And uh, Dr. Jackson is going to play an introduction, then I'll bring you in, and we'll sing the whole thing. You're doing wonderfully. Thank you so much. Ready? How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all men. That he could give his only son To make a wretch's treasure How great the pain of searing loss The father burns his face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Unto glory. Thank you. Be seated. Good job. Thank you very much. Well, you know, with laid plans of mice and men, they say. Sound, what did I tell you? Who lives in the soundboard? The Satan lives in the soundboard, yes, indeed. <laughs> so we need to do an exorcism on the way out this morning. Um, well, we have, um, we have lots of opportunity this morning, and um, you all sang beautifully. Um, we're going to sing that hymn at Austin's ordination service in a couple of weeks. Um, and so we wanted you to be familiar with it and so that you could worship with abandon on July the 10th. It's going to be a great day. Um, so many of you were able to be here with us yesterday for Go Day, and it was fun. Um, there were a lot of things that got accomplished. Um, we worked on um, a house over here on Fisher's Luck. Um, they needed some help with a fence. Um, they worked on building a ramp out in Sonoy, and then we had the children who were here as well, and and we, um, everybody just did a great job. And actually, as Austin was doing his children's time, I kept thinking, what a great illustration of what happened yesterday, right? Is God loved us, and loved other people. And that's what we do. Um, because it is truly that wells up out of us that we then go out into the world and live out. Well, I've got some guests this morning who are doing exactly that. Um, George and Jean Haugen are here with us this morning. How many of you know George and, and Jean? A lot of you. I thought that might be the case. Uh, they serve on the other side of the world in the name of Jesus. They both attended Fuller Seminary. They are both ordained pastors, and they have served in churches and other organizations around the country and around the globe. And they are supported in part by the generous giving of Evergreen Church. And this morning, I've asked them to come share um, part of their story and then to lend us their professional assistance as we seek to be missionaries in our own neighborhoods. So, as they make their way to the platform this morning, would you warmly welcome George and Jean Hogg to the platform? may need to do some moving around, but wherever you all are comfortable, I'm going to give you that. You're getting used to these interview sermons, aren't you? Yeah. 
Um, so we have been working through, and we, we met the other day, we've been working through the book of Ephesians this summer, and um, we're in chapter 4, and one of the interesting things about chapter 4 is Paul begins it by saying, live a life worthy of your calling. Um, and so um, you all have been off, well, I, and I gave you a brief introduction, you've been off serving around the globe, and we handed out a piece of paper. We don't want to mention this morning exactly where they are, um, because this is being streamed over the internet, and so um, we, we're fine with you knowing where they are, we just don't want the whole world to know. Um, and so why don't you say a little bit more about what you all are doing um, and who you're serving and, and what you're up to? Yeah. Well, first of all, it is wonderful to be here with you all this morning. And uh, we, this was our church uh, in like 2012 through 2014. We had come back from living somewhere else in the world. And uh, yeah, this church welcomed us warmly and it was such a blessing to to be part of this fellowship. And so it's great to be back with you this morning. Um, yes, we do live on kind of the other side of the world uh, in kind of more the Middle East area of the world. Um, and we can't give a lot of details because of security reasons, but if you do look at that sheet, it tells you there's some more information. But uh, we work with two different people groups there, one of whom are refugees uh, living in refugee camps there. And uh, so we, uh, part of what we do is we're part of a team that has medical doctors and nurses, that we have a clinic in one of those refugee camps that has about, in that one camp, about 14,000 people. Uh, and um, yeah, so that's part of what we do. And we seek to, we've talked a lot about the love of God and the love of Jesus this morning, and we're seeking to share the love of Jesus with people. And Jean, you're a therapist, right? So I am. I'm a um, marriage and family therapist, and I have been serving um, the ECO mission team agency called uh, the Olympiad Partners for many years in member care, so I actually work with other people serving around the world, as well as um, I'll be working in a refugee camp uh, doing trauma counseling. And when we were talking the other day, one of the things that you all mentioned was the length of time people lived in the refugee camps. Just say a little bit about that. I think it's very shocking for us to realize when we think of refugees um, that many refugees live in refugee camps anywhere from 12 to 20 years. They live in tents. Can you imagine children that know nothing but living in and um, we talked a little bit about the, um, the, the way people um, view Christians, um, Western Christians in particular, and that was enlightening to me, and I think it might be enlightening to you all as well. Just say a little bit about that as well. Um, yeah, so uh, the where we live is very much, uh, there are not very many Christians there, not many followers of Jesus, uh, but the one assumption that is made is that everyone who lives in the United States is a Christian. Um, and so then they see TV and movies and other things that are coming out of the United States and they think, wow, well if that's the way Christians are, we don't, we're not interested in that. We don't want to have anything to do with that. And one interesting thing we shared with Don is that um, <laughs> there are very few liquor stores in the city that we live in. Uh, the only people who can own and operate liquor stores are Christians or, uh, yeah, I won't go into other, but um, that area of town where the liquor stores are is called the Christian area. Uh, because the Christians are the ones that deal in alcohol. Uh, so this is it's not exactly the image that we're going for, right? Um, but, um, but it's certainly understandable. And, um, 
Is there anything else you want to share with us before I kind of move into to Ephesians and some of the things we talked about? But is there anything else that you all want to share um, with the congregation? Oh, I know what I wanted, actually wanted you to talk a little bit about global Christianity and sort of the state of Christianity um, from your perspective, um, not, just, not in the West, but where you all are. All are. crisis, the hopelessness of where we live, and even here, people need the Lord. Um, but, you know, one exciting thing is that, is that God is at work. Um, God is at work building his church. Jesus promised that he would build his church, and he does not lie. Um, he is building his church. Um, and sometimes we think when we live in a place like the United States or maybe Europe, we see, oh, the church is decreasing in numbers. People don't go to the church like they used to. And then we need to realize that in other places around the world, like in Latin America or places in Asia or different places around the world, the church is booming. Um, booming with growth in unexpected places. In some places, uh, near where we live um, in kind of secret ways where it cannot be known. It's house churches, underground churches, uh, but the church is, is growing. Um, and uh, so, yes, we uh, need to realize that the Lord is keeping his promise and he's building his church in exciting unexpected ways. I think it's exciting and, and important for us to remember um, that global Christianity is not necessarily just what happens here. Right? Most often we, we interpret things, and I understand why, we interpret things you know, based upon what's going on around us. But there are, there are movements across the globe where God is building the church, and that is a very important thing and should be encouraging to us um, as, as, we, as we seek to be missionaries of Christ here. And one of the things that I shared with um, Jean and George is, is our vision statement, which is to inspire, teach, and disciple ordinary people to be missionaries of Christ in their own local communities so that our neighborhoods reflect the kingdom of heaven. And um, so one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, since you are um, out there right, with people who aren't not necessarily Christian, um, I, I wanted to talk with you and, and get your feedback and practical tips about, well, how do we reach our neighbors? Because I think for a lot of us, it's not that we don't want to. I don't know that we always know how to. Um, and so if you were going to tell us anything about how to reach our neighbors, where, where would you start? That's a good question. Um, one thing that we have found, we've lived in South America, the Caribbean, Africa, uh, Asia, um, that people want to have people praying for them, no matter what their religion. And for me, to know that, that if I ask a stranger, and we've done it many, many, many thousands of times, can I pray for you? The answer is most always, yes, please. No matter what their religious background is, people want to be prayed for. And to, to me, that just makes my heart feel with so much joy. So that's been a tool that we use no matter where we are, um, just asking people, how can I pray for you? And either praying with them right then and there, or saying, hey, we're going to go back to our community and we're going to be praying. Uh, so we're just gathering prayer requests. So I, for me, that's just a key that can happen anywhere. And I feel like sometimes we get afraid to do that, but I just want to encourage you. People are hungry to hear that you would want to pray for them. Mm. 
Anything you want to add? Um, I think uh, another thing that, uh, well, two things. Um, one is that uh, sometimes we think, well, those people are kind of professional gospel sharers, so they maybe don't struggle with fear. And that is so not true. <laughs> um, that as we think about being missional, as we think about the love of Christ and what that drove Jesus to do, there's, that involves crossing barriers, whether that means crossing a barrier of going to another country or crossing a barrier and going to our next door neighbor who maybe we don't know very well or going to a coworker that uh, we, and, and, and reaching out to them in the love of Christ. Um, and I have found that the hardest thing if you, is actually, because we do need to actually speak about Jesus at some point, because we can be nice people, and if we never actually speak about Jesus, then they think, oh, that person is just the nicest person ever. Um, but we, so we do need to open our mouths and speak about Jesus. Uh, and I found two things. One is that the hardest part is actually just getting started. You know, just opening up your mouth because you, you begin to think, oh, what if they don't, what if they get angry? What if they're not ready? What if they have a question I can't answer? What if all these what ifs? And if you just kind of breach the subject a little bit, hopefully in a not obnoxious way, um, then I have found that people will talk um, and that, uh, yeah, they are, uh, many people are interested to know more. Um, and so the hardest part is, is getting started, just beginning to speak about being kind of intentional about reaching out and opening up our mouths and speaking about the Lord. It's not easy, though. It's not easy. It's not. So if you find it to be difficult, you are not alone. Yeah. That does not excuse you, however. Um, right? I mean, because the, you know, when we were talking, and I've said this to somebody last week, too, I mean, some of the nicest people I know are atheists. Right? So just being nice is only opening the door. There is also the speaking of the name of Jesus. So people understand what it is in your heart, what's driving that, what's fueling that. And I love the idea of praying for people. I think it's so important, and I also think it can be very intimidating, um, until you actually do it once, mm -hmm. right? It only takes a one positive experience to see someone, even in a grocery store, that you can tell, you know, is having a hard time, you know, can I pray with you? that you've touched them. It just, if you know, again, people need the Lord and they're hungry. And in today's time, people are so hungry for connection. We've been so isolated because of COVID and mm. it's just set us back so far. But people need connection. They want to see in your eyes that you care about them. And what a, I mean, what a true authentic way to say, I care about you is to take somebody's need to the Lord, um, right? I mean, it's easy for me to say I care about you, but, but if I'm actually then willing to take your need to the Lord is a whole other thing. Um, yeah, and, and it's exactly, I mean, Austin's children's sermon couldn't have been more on point, right? I mean, the love that's poured into us, we pour into other people, and we do that in various ways. We talked a little bit about how people have poured it into your lives where you are, They are so gracious. I, I mean, several nights a week I get a knock at the door and someone brings us food. It is such a gift. I feel like, how can I ever repay my neighbors for all that they keep giving to me? Um, and so I just want to encourage you. Walk across the yard and, and give a smile to your neighbor or take them some fresh baked bread or some cookies you picked up in the grocery store. Um, it means so much to have a stranger who I know doesn't believe in, in, in my God 
continue to pour themselves out, just coming over, just to say, I know you're hurting here, and I care about you. I care about you. And, and that message just goes so deep to see the people that reach out in little ways and big ways to us ongoingly. And I'm like, I never did this when I was in these days. But I could have. Right. Um, I mean, and I think we all, I mean, we've all been in that, that spot, right, where we've lived next to people for years and never really ever gone across the street. And, um, it, and, and I would ask you or either one of you, so if, if, if I've been living in a place for a while and I actually haven't really met my neighbors other than, hi, <laughs> you know, um, when I'm taking out the garbage or getting the mail, um, h- how... How do I do that now? If I've lived in a place for five years, what do I what do I do? I, I get excited about that because I'm like, it doesn't matter if you've lived next to someone five years, thirty years, and don't even know them. Today, this week, you can say, I'm gonna go and just tell them hi. Or I'm gonna just go and and bring them a plant, or just say, hey, you know, we live over here and and I never have an opportunity to see you and I just wanted to to just let you know that I I see you coming and going but I just wanted to say hi up close and for me um, something as simple as that um, and now you've challenged me so you can hold me accountable but she's challenged me Um, if we want our neighborhoods to look like the kingdom of heaven it kind of has to start there right? I mean, it's small, but it has to start in that small place, because if it doesn't start there, it's not going to start really at all. Um, You know, I had a friend who said the worst evangelism tool in the world is the garage door opener, because people just open their garage doors and pull their cars in and close the door, and that's that, right? So we don't ever really meet our neighbors. Um, Maybe some of you can't get your car in your garage, but that's another story and another sermon. But... um, yeah, I, I think that that's such an important thing. And we talked about, and you mentioned a, a little bit about the hopelessness that you've seen. So talk a little bit about the hopelessness maybe that you guys experience in the context you're in and what you've seen here as well. Um, well, yes, definitely where we live, there's a, a lot of hopelessness for a variety of reasons. People have suffered a lot of trauma from war, from um, from just instability, from... I mean, there's still violence that goes on uh, with missiles being shot every day in different, uh, close to where we are. Um, And also just a lack of work opportunities. And so people, there's a real lack of hope. And people think the only way I can get hope is to get out of this place and get anywhere else in the world. Um, And yet we know that there's hopelessness all over the place. I was t- saying to Jean on the drive over here, I never forget when we were actually living in Philadelphia and uh, I was walking out of our front door and down the steps and this young college student, bright uh, young woman came walking up. She was coming to talk with Jean and uh, I was like, hey, how are you doing? You know, and she's like, oh, great, everything's wonderful. You know, and she's smiling and came to find out that she came in and began to talk about Jean, to talk to Jean about how she wanted to kill herself. Um, and just, you, you never know that the hopelessness that you might find in unexpected places right around here and you're with your neighbors, people really struggling, and they need a sense of the fact that yes, God sees them, God loves them, and he's there for them. Um, in Christ. Yeah. One of the things George and I have been really looking into lately is the brain science around uh, what, what feeds our brain and come to find out it's joy. And do you know what joy is? Joy is seeing in someone else's eye that they're glad to be with you. So for me to communicate to someone else had to be with you mm. gives them joy and that's what our brain needs we're starving it for that those out there 
are starving for that. Yeah, um, you keep challenging me. Um, but, it's, but, it's, but it's good, because I honestly think when you look at, we've been talking about Ephesians for a number of weeks, and you look at chapters 1 through 3, and you see this grand vision of, of salvation history that Paul is laying out, it should, ins- it should inspire joy in us. Um, and I think so often that when we, uh, maybe I should use I instead of we, but when we do evangelism, right, when we go to our neighbors, we're almost going because we want something from them instead of going to give them ourselves. And that's a, there's a big difference between those two things. And people can feel it. I mean, I honestly think that sometimes um, that's the problem with evangelism, <laughs> is I'm trying to get something from you rather than give you my heart. And, um, and it's not always easy because, it, because we have to make ourselves vulnerable, we have to do all of those sort of things. Um, but at the, end, at the end of the day, for, for our little, you know, three-foot square of, you know, mission field that God gives us at every, at every moment, um, we have to invite other people in, um, little by little. Can I share a brief story? Absolutely. Uh, when my husband and I first, uh, years ago, years ago, we were living in um, the Democratic Republic of and um, the poverty was so overwhelming. I've never, never seen anything like that. And for me to go to the one normal grocery store, there would be like 30 people lying between me and the entrance to the grocery store. And I had to literally jump over people. They were all there begging. They were crippled with, with things that I, I just never had seen before, legs that looked like noodles. Um, I had to jump over them to go grocery shopping. It overwhelmed my soul so much. Mm. And I just wanted to live as a horse with blinders so I couldn't see it. And the Lord spoke to me. And he said, look at him. And I realized that the only thing he was asking me to do was to validate their humanity. To not jump over them as a horse uh, with blinders, but to actually look at them, talk to them, greet them. But that's all I needed to do, was to just validate their humanity. And I feel like we get away from that. There's something that keeps us from just looking at people Mm -hmm. and validating their humanity. And I guess at the end of the day, isn't that what Jesus did? Right? Jesus looked at us and and said, I love this you know, example of, you know, we love because God first loved us yep. and that water changed in color and it's only because of that. Exactly. That we that we want to validate other people's humanity. Yeah. And love them as well. And that's what you all are doing on the other side of the world. I mean, in every conversation that you have, um, in every, you know, every interaction that you have with your neighbors or, or it, with a refugee camp or wherever it is that you are, that's exactly what you're doing. Um, and they're doing it not for themselves. They're doing it for the Lord, but they're also doing it on your behalf, right? That's why they're there. Um, but here's the thing. We're also doing the exact same thing they're doing, but over on Larkspur Turn or Peachtree Parkway, or wherever it is that you call home, is it's not vastly different. It seems different because you're so, we're all so used to the context. I mean, you, don't, you didn't have to learn the language. You don't have to learn the culture. They do, right? But we don't. We already have those tools at our disposal. But the question is, can we get past that initial barrier and say, Hello. You know? Now, it also can be at work, it can be at school, it can be any number of places. Um, but I think that's that's the challenge. And and we are all I mean, I don't remember who said it, but if you're a Christian, you're a missionary. Um, and we're all missionaries. 
in, in one way or another, right? Um, so, I, I, um, Jean, would you pray for us this morning? I was gonna, is there anything else you all want to share before we, before Just, we pray? Can I share something? Right Absolutely. Um, as we were driving here, actually, again, um, and I was looking, we were, got off, we were coming up from Columbus, Georgia, and got off there at noon, and then we're coming over, and there were a lot of churches um, and then as we were pulling into Peachtree City, there were two men crossing the street. And as I looked at them with their head covering and, and I looked at them, I, I was like, I think those men are Sikh from India. And I was wondering, I wonder if anybody from any of these churches have ever reached out to them and mm. talked to them. That one thing has blown us away is how people there where we live have been so kind to us and invited us into their homes and there are a lot of people from all over the world coming here. And I think most of them never have anybody reach out to them and, and befriend them and invite them into a, an American home and have a meal. Or, and I think if you did that, you would be surprised how, what a wonderful, warm reception you would get from people and what a good friend you would have. Mm -hmm because the, uh, you would find someone who would be very loyal and caring and friendly back. Yeah. How blessed you would be for that. Yeah. Um, one other little thing that has been a little hard for me, it's a little heart issue, is when I live there, I have to dress in clothes to the ankles and below my elbows to not be offensive to the culture. And I think sometimes as Americans, you know, we don't like people to tell us how to dress. We don't like people to tell us what's right and what's wrong. But I've had to learn that it's so important to not be offensive to those around me. And that's something that I do think that we in the American culture have lost, that sense of showing respect, that we respect ourselves and that we respect others by the way we, we, we carry ourselves and look. And um, I, just, I just caution you to be a little bit more aware and intentional. Like, I don't want to offend somebody else because of, of how I am. Mm -hmm. That's a, a big part uh, in the Middle East, but I think we can take some lessons from that. Right. Well, if you're offending them before you ever say the name of Jesus based upon what you're wearing, that's a problem, right? Yeah. You know? Yes. Um, and certainly, I, you're right. Culturally, we don't like that, do we? No. 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 Um, but it's a very real part of that culture in other places. Yeah. yeah. Well, good. I love the praise. So thank you for the privilege. Let's pray together. People need the Lord. That's why we're all here today. We know our need, God, for you. We thank you for the reminders that we hear and see in others that people need you. Lord, we just pray that you'll continue to spur us on from that truth. Lord, even as we saw today of how you have loved us and have, have empowered us and asked us to love others, Lord, help us to be people of love. Help us to look at others with a gleam in our eyes that we are so happy to know them, to be in relationship with them. Lord, we thank you so much for this church, this fellowship of believers and these missional people. Bless them, Lord Jesus. Continue to send them out. For your name sake, because people need you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you please thank John and George for being here this morning? I'll take it. Otherwise, we'll be searching for it. As we prepare our giving this morning... Let us be mindful of the blessings that God has poured into our lives. 
And they are new every morning. They are not just our material goods, they are also the spirit that God gives us, the health God pours into our lives, the energy that God gives us. And so, as we, um, as we prepare ourselves to respond to the Lord this morning, uh, would you pray with me? God, we are always looking for ways to respond to you in good ways. And so, Lord, we ask that you would hear our prayer this morning as we come to you with open hearts and open hands. We ask, Lord, that you would take whatever we give, our time, our feet across the street, our conversation with a coworker. We ask that you would take that and use it and multiply it for the good of your kingdom. We thank you for George and Jean. We thank you for, uh, for the work that you have given them and for people all over the world who are doing similar work. We thank you for the movement of your church across the globe and in this place. So pour your spirit out upon us and give us the courage to give ourselves away. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you stand with me for the doxology? Would you join me in the affirmation of faith which will be on the screen? This is the hope of the gospel which, pro- which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, the mystery which has now been manifested to us, God's saints. Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him all things were created in heaven and on earth, things visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things exist and hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he may have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, And through him, God was pleased to reconcile all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Amen.
We have a congregational meeting directly after this service, so I would ask you, if you are able, to please remain in the sanctuary for this important meeting. But for those of you who will be going back out into the world, remember how much God loves you. Remember that he is with and for you and has been all along. Remember that he has placed your feet in a specific place with specific people to reach in his name. And so go out and love your neighbors and serve the Lord. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and in you both now and forever. Amen. You may be seated, George and Jean. If you want to meet people in the lobby, you are certainly welcome to do so. You may play the postlude while we get let other people come on in. laughing about. Yes, definitely.